Welcome to today's webinar about the three mistakes that non-native speakers make in leadership positions, and most importantly, how to fix them. My name is Tanya Suarez as a leadership communication coach who has worked with non-native speakers for over 20 years. The three things I'm going to show you today are the things I see over and over again that are really hurting your fluency and your leadership communication progress, and you might not even realize that you're doing it. In fact, as we go through the three things today, I want you to see if you identify with them, if you do them, and how often you find yourself committing these mistakes. Now, the first thing I want to look at here is this great quote by the Harvard Business Review. Leaders who aren't native English speakers must navigate additional obstacles from cultural misunderstandings to biases that question their professional capabilities, often resulting in exclusion from decision-making processes. That's a really big deal. It's not just that you want to improve your English for the sake of improving your English, because let's be honest, by the time you're here and you're watching this, in fact, by the time most of you are in leadership positions, your English is good enough on a technical level. If you took a test, you would pass. However, it's the communication, understanding the cultural nuances. Those are the things that are keeping you out of some really important conversations or important rooms where decisions are being made. And you cannot afford that, especially at this point in your career. So you're here because you probably feel like you freeze a lot. You know, at this point in English, it's not that you don't have the words. It's that whether it's the nerves, the insecurities, there comes a moment where you might feel like you're frozen and you can't quite get the right words at the right time. And that's very inconvenient, but also very frustrating. You're also here because there's some level of jealousy. Um, it can really creep up because most of the people who are in leadership positions, most of the people that I work with are very high achievers and <laughs> very either competitive and or perfectionists. So when you're in these rooms, in these meetings and conversations where you constantly see people who speak English better than you, it can hurt your confidence. And when your ego is bruised, it can also hurt your fluency and then your performance. Another reason you're probably here is because you cause confusion. And I don't mean this in a bad way because I, I know you're not trying to, but there are certain things that you're doing. In fact, that's one of the things we're going to talk about today as a common mistake that are causing people to not understand you clearly. And you might not even realize that you're doing it or you're seeing the face of confusion and you're making the connection that it must be your accent or your English. And so your way of finding a solution is to keep studying and grow your vocabulary when actually there's a different problem that needs a different solution. And another reason that you're probably here is because you want to sound like yourself in English. It can be really frustrating to know how confident and professional you are and probably how personable you are. I know a lot of people that I work with are like, I'm really funny in my native language. I'm so outgoing. But then in English, I become a complete introvert and I'm so serious. And that can hurt your networking ability. It also hurts your ability to make genuine connections, which are frustrating on a personal level, but extremely frustrating on a professional level where you need those connections. Another reason that you're probably here is because you wish that your English helped you represent your expertise more accurately. When you feel like your English is more basic or lower than your native language, there are certain things that you're going to do to overcompensate that that hurt your communication and your confidence, even though you're trying to fix that. And it's so frustrating to see that there are two different versions of you and that you know that if you could just explain this in, a, in your native language, it would be so much more eloquent and professional. So there are a lot of mindset changes that you're going to have to make in order to be able to thrive and really communicate clearly and effectively. And that's why we're here today. Now, the other thing I want you to know is that you are not alone. I have worked with people from over 30 countries. I'm so familiar with the nuances of different cultures and languages. It is not just you, I promise. And even the companies that I have here, I've worked with leaders and executives at some of the top companies in the world. These are people who you might see and think, oh, that person is exactly who I want to be. And you don't even realize how many insecurities and how much training they've had to do in order to be that confident, successful self. So you're not alone. And that means if you're not alone, other people have had the same problems you've had, which means that there are solutions for you. 
So back to the topic at hand, today we're going to talk about the three mistakes that non-native speakers make in leadership positions, and most importantly, how to fix them. The first thing we're going to do is talk about confidence. So the first mistake has to do with this, which as you see here is one of the pillars of my leadership communication accelerator, which I'll tell you more about at the end of the webinar. But this is something that is a really important foundation for your communication in English. And today we're gonna to talk about a specific mistake. The thing I see most people think erroneously, meaning it's a mistake, is that you think your problem is your pronunciation or your accent. So I get a lot of people that come to me thinking, I need you to help me with my accent. I need you to help me with, with fluency because people don't understand me. That might be a fraction of the problem. At this point in your career, it's probably not the main, I mean, I'm telling you right now, it's not the main problem. But when that's the thing that sets you apart, the thing that makes you different, I understand why you think that's a problem. And in fact, I've had people who come to me telling me that my man, that their managers or that their directors have told them that, that they need to work on their pronunciation. And so they send them to me. But that's because as a non-native speaker, who's not an educator, who's not a coach, I understand why they also think that's the problem. However, you want to focus on something slightly different than your pronunciation. And in fact, here, I just want you to see how important it is with the training that I do. Uh, here, this client of mine who came to me, it was so rewarding because by the end of our training, he was able to really own his accent. So if you feel insecure, some of you might feel ashamed. You know, we've all had different experiences of whether we're judged or discriminated against. So if this is a point of insecurity, my goal is that you feel confident about your accent. Your accent does not hurt you or hurt your chances. It's your clarity, communication, and confidence. So that's very important for you to absorb. Now, with this mistake of thinking that it's your pronunciation, the problems that are actually happening is that you speak too fast. Sure, there are some moments where maybe your TH is not very clear or your S is or you have the dark L and the light L. But more often than not, it's your speed. Now, this can happen for one of two reasons, or both. Sometimes non-native speakers speak quickly because you're just nervous. When you're nervous, your heart rate accelerates. When your heart rate accelerates, you just naturally have more adrenaline and speak faster. Or, and or, a lot of times I find that this is a coping mechanism, that you're speaking faster because you think, if I speak faster, I sound more like a native speaker, and if I make a mistake, people won't notice. Unfortunately, maybe they don't notice a mistake that you think that they might notice, but it doesn't help them understand you, and that can cause some pretty significant problems. So the solution to that problem is to breathe more. Now, this is strategic, and I spoke about this in the webinar last week. It's about when and how you breathe. The way that you breathe also impacts your intonation, your rhythm. And so this is really helpful to get more comfortable with the American emphasis and intonation. I would recommend, at least to begin with, the first thing I want you to do is observe how often you breathe. You'll find that most non-native speakers hold their breath a lot. And so I just want you to just observe it and relax. Then as you're getting more comfortable with the awareness, I want you to take a tiny inhale before you speak, before every sentence or every thought. It's really important, and this is where the strategy comes in. I don't want you to inhale, exhale. How are you today? It's a tiny inhale through your mouth, not your nose. How are you today? So I want you to practice that. At first, it's going to feel unnatural. Most people, when I coach them at the beginning, it takes a while to stop breathing through their nose when they speak and just a tiny inhale through your mouth. You shouldn't even be able to see it, but you can feel it. This is going to help you have the oxygen that you need. Also, it starts regulating the rhythm. When you have the oxygen, you calm down, you speak more clearly. When you are able to breathe regularly. So the first thing I train is at least at the beginning of every thought. And then when you go deeper into it, there are other moments that help you break down the sentences because Americans, we speak more in chunks than in sections, like full sentences. But at least start there. Tiny inhale. And then when you speak, that's the exhale. This is a huge difference in clarity and confidence because the more you see people understand you and you're like, oh, Build your confidence. It's going to help you continue that improvement. 
Now, another problem that's actually happening is that you're keeping your mouth small. And what I mean by this is some of this has to do with your native language. When you're used to speaking from a part here, but then you start speaking like this in English, it becomes really difficult for people to like really understand you. And then you're, when you start going, so having your mouth small, it makes it sound kind of muffled. It also, you have a tendency to fall back to old pronunciation patterns when your mouth is that small. English is very, all languages are very muscular. It's about your cheeks, your lips, your tongue, the jaw. It's really important to give your mouth the space to make the sound, which, you know, if you've done the American R training where you have to pull your, your tongue back. So if you don't open your mouth more, your mouth is going to, your tongue is going to fall back into old patterns, which impact your pronunciation and accent. But more importantly, it impacts the clarity, which then impacts your confidence. So I want you to practice. It's going to feel unnatural at first, but just start walking around the house. I recommend like narrating what you're doing. I'm going to make a cup of coffee. Wow, it's so pretty outside. You're going to sound like a cartoon at first. That's fine. The whole goal is to really acknowledge the, the muscular tendencies and the muscular space that English needs. I promise you when you add the real life situation and the adrenaline kicks in, it balances out and then it looks more natural, but you want to practice a little bit exaggerated on your own. So the solution here is instead of focusing so much on pronunciation, it's really more about opening your mouth. And last but not least, you plan instead of listening. At this point, you've worked really hard. Most of you, by the time I work with people, you've done the work of not translating anymore. So you've stopped translating in your head before you speak. That is a huge milestone in terms of language development. But then what happens is, especially when I work with leaders and professionals, you're natural overthinkers. Most of you are, are, are again, high achievers, perfectionists. So what this, what this does is you're not, like you're listening, but you're not listening. You're there, but you're not there. And so your brain is trying to compose okay, what do I want to say next? What's the correct way of saying it? What's the sentence structure? Where does a verb go? So unfortunately, even if you're half listening, your body language is not going to reflect your personality. It's going to look tense and serious because you might be talking about how cute your dog is before a meeting and I'm looking, okay, what, does the verb, what do I want to say? So what that does is it doesn't help or what it doesn't do is it doesn't help you connect with people. It also doesn't help you react naturally. If you're so busy planning, you're probably going to speak in a more unnatural way. And honestly, that means a more correct way. I find that non-native speakers tend to use more complex sentence structure than native speakers because you want to be more correct, whereas American communication tends to be very casual, very short. This is not easy to train out of, and I just want you to remember that it was not easy to stop translating in your head. But when you get the tools that you need and we have consistent practice and feedback, this is a game changer. So as your, your speech is clearer, your pronunciation's better because you're speaking slower, you're, you're breathing more, you're opening your mouth more. And then when you're able to listen, you're able to react better and your speech is going to be more natural because you simplify it. And that's going to increase your confidence because you have this constant feedback and validation that people understand you and that you feel like yourself. So this is much better than going back into just practicing pronunciation. There's nothing wrong with practicing pronunciation, you know, do it, but understand that that's not the main problem. So I would rather you shift your, your focus or increase the amount of time you're working on all of the things that I'm showing you here. All right, now this is the result. So I had a client who went through my leadership communication accelerator and it was that. She's like, I speak too fast, people don't understand me. And I get kind of anxious and nervous. And she's like, I'm confident. I promise. I just, this is what, what's happening. And so through the training, she was able to start speaking up more because she found that because she knew she spoke really fast, it made her feel a little more reserved, a little more hesitant to speak up in meetings. And she was in really important meetings. Her work impacts the community. It impacts the university that she works for. This is a professor. She had to work with local government. And not speaking up was hurting the amount of funding she was getting for the programs. 
So now by being able to feel the confidence, knowing that when she did speak, it was going to be so much better and well understood and well received because then we work on how to be diplomatic. This increased her confidence. And within a couple of weeks, she was really seeing the effect of, oh, I'm not as nervous before meetings now because I know I'm speaking up more. So it becomes this, instead of a vicious cycle in a negative way, it becomes a cycle of confidence that keeps building on itself. And it's so empowering. So again, to repeat, you think your problem is pronunciation, but it's not. I want you to focus more on confidence specifically the three items that we worked on today, that's a good starting point because a big part of how I coach is I don't like doing theory. You know, when you have so much to learn or something really broad, I really believe in, look, you can get that anywhere, but I really believe that small actionable tips and you might, you know, I get people who get defensive, like, no, 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 tell me everything. Like, no, do these small actionable moments, do them habitually, build on that. And I promise you the results are exponential. The second mistake I see non-native speakers do in leadership positions is over-explaining. And I want you to think about how often you over-explain. I find that if you over-explain with work things, you're probably over-explaining in other moments, even in casual conversations. My favorite example is pay attention to how you answer the question, how are you or how was your weekend? If you tend to give a long explanation or description, you're also doing this in personal moments. Now, it's really important to know why you over-explain, but here let's talk about the importance. So looking at this article from India, this quote, in the age of globalization, effective leaders know that even small adjustments, like using pauses instead of fillers, can have a big impact, offering non-native speakers a moment to absorb information and communicate more authoritatively. Now, this is really important because, of course, we want to have pausing more than fillers, But what I find that in addition to that, if you're using pauses instead of fillers, but you're still over explaining, it might sound clear, but the communication is not going to be as effective as it could be. So this next tip is about clarity. So what I meant by understanding why you do it, the reason that most non-native speakers over explain is cultural and linguistic. And we'll start with the cultural first. So if you take a look at this, most cultures fall into one of these two categories, high context or low context. If you're from a high context culture, which I'll show you kind of where you might fall on on the spectrum, you're going to tend to over explain first. And so that's why I have the triangle there. The triangle is to represent how you give information. So you're going to give a lot and then kind of get to the point. So when you understand that you're from a culture that communicates in this way and you realize, oh, I'm not translating word for word in English, but I am translating the style. And so American communication is low context. So we actually value more directness. So what happens is you think you're over, you don't think you're over explaining. You just think you're explaining. When you give a lot of information at first to an American, sometimes it can come across as suspicious, not suspicious in like a legal way, but suspicious in a way where you know, why is this person saying so much? Are they hiding something? Are they doing that because they're making up for the fact that they don't have that expertise? So unfortunately, you're trying to showcase your expertise and it's having the opposite effect. Now, with low context, even if your culture falls in a low context style, it's still going to be different with Americans because sometimes, and I'll show you some examples here, I find that even though Germans and Russians tend to be low context, they're way more direct than Americans. So then the way that you communicate if you're from those cultures is going to come across a little bit more aggressive if you get to the point without that politeness or diplomacy. So then if you're from a Latin American culture, for example, Arabic speakers, these are all cultures that tend to to explain more and then get to the point. I always tell my clients, like, you take me through a journey before the destination (laughs) and Americans want the destination. And then if they want to know about your journey, they'll ask about it or you can ask if they want to know more. So this is really important because this is different than what native speakers experience. Native speakers are also taught in leadership communication to be more direct, but they don't have the same cultural habit. You have a habit that's ingrained in you from birth that you're trying to, you're not changing your native language communication, but it is about, wow, okay, I've been doing this for decades. Now I need to adapt and really understand and 
practice, 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 because understanding it is very different than in the moment when you have all these eyes on you expecting an explanation and being able to process that and say that with confidence. So what I teach in the program is a visual. I usually recommend draw a triangle on a little piece of paper, on a post-it, keep it by your computer. This is a reminder to get to the point politely. You'll notice here I put politely in parentheses. That's for my people who are from a low context culture, but you're a little too direct. So with Americans, being polite is very important because um, the whole point, it's not to, I'm going to pause here. A lot of times when we get to this point in the program, some, some people get a little defensive of like, no, I don't want to adapt to the American way. Like I am who I am. And I like to remind them, we adapt our language all the time. You don't talk, let's say if you have kids, you don't talk to your two-year-old the same way you do to your 12-year-old, the same way you do to your husband or, and then your, your mother. We adapt the way we speak depending on our audience. So that's how I want you to embrace this. I want you to think about, okay, I'm in this global American English setting. By adapting to my audience, I'm able to have more productive conversations. Because if you spoke to your husband or your wife like you did to your two-year-old, you know that would not go over well. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if you're like, well, that's who I am. No, you can be authentic to yourself and adapt to your audience. It's part of the beauty of communication. So if you do feel a little bit of defensiveness, I understand where it's coming from, but this is where the mindset shift is really important. And that's a big part of my coaching is understanding where your mindset is now and then adapting it to a way that allows you to communicate most effectively. Now, when you are in a regular program, like a, and a, when I say regular, I mean just a generic leadership communication program, that's kind of where it stops. But the reason I did this program is when it comes to non-native speakers, there's another layer to it. I can tell you get to the point and you can understand it. But when it comes to actually practicing, the word choice to be able to redirect is where the challenge is. So another part of the coaching is understanding what language to use. So here, and look, we're all human. You're going to over explain at some point. It's not about never doing it. It's also about knowing how to fix it. So if I, if you catch yourself going on and on or over explaining a story, you're like, oh, I'm doing it again. Take a breath. You know what? To make a long story short, in the fourth quarter, we need to focus on production. So having those phrases that are really popular in American English, knowing when to use them and how to use them to help redirect your conversation style is very powerful. And this is what I do for other situations, for example, speaking up in a meeting, sharing opinions, interrupting, how to handle when people interrupt you. You can understand the theory, but it's also about having the phrases, the English to be able to implement that solution. So let's take a look at this quote here. When I had this client in my program, he thought he knew that it was about sounding more American. However, with the training, you know, he was able to appreciate that his English was great. His accent was great. There were some moments where we had to clarify certain sounds and then we identified high frequency words. But what was really lacking was the storytelling. And so having this triangle approach was a game changer because he presented a lot in company meetings and having to explain these high tech updates to a company full of departments where not everybody is tech. I mean, you know, like you've got the marketers, you've got the salespeople, they're not going to have the same level of knowledge as your engineers, for example. So how to craft the story, how to express yourself, how to share the updates in a way that the audience, in this case, a diverse knowledge-based audience could appreciate. So once you realize the structure, that's where we make it more personal. Like, okay, what are the moments where you're struggling to implement that triangle method? And then in addition to that, okay, now that you're direct, how do we make it engaging? How can you be direct and diplomatic? So it's really multi-layered, but this gives you a good place to start. So if you find yourself over explaining, take a deep breath. And now, you know, get to the point. Start with the most important thing. This happens a lot where people will not answer directly. Whenever I work with Brazilians, I love you all, but something that's very characteristic of the way you communicate. If someone asks you a question, you go off on all these stories and you never actually answer the question. And so what I like to remind you is this kind of thought process, like, okay, 
be direct, answer the question first, and then share your stories and the details. Now, the third mistake I see people make in leadership positions is that you avoid small talk and networking. This is very common. Even native speakers, you'll hear a lot of native speakers say that they hate small talk. And the reason is it can feel disingenuous. It can feel superficial. For non-native speakers, it's even more than that. Because not only are you struggling to figure out, okay, what topics are appropriate, then it's the pressure of how do I start the conversation? What do Americans appreciate? I have certain people, for example, going back to Brazilians, who are so open that when they start a conversation, they offer too much personal information, and that can feel odd to an American. I have other cultures who are super, super direct and short, and to an American, that can feel aggressive or like they'll think you don't like them. So this is really important for not only working on small talk, but again, realizing what is it about your cultural communication from your native language that's impacting your communication in English, and then how can we adapt that and then work on the phrases and the strategy and the appropriate topics, for example. And for me, it's something that I love with small talk is you can learn superficial small talk on any YouTube channel. And that's great. Like those are basic. How's the weather? Da, da, da. So with this program, because it's also leadership and you're making high end connections and increasing your network, it's how to go from that superficial small talk and quickly, organically go a little deeper. Because the more you connect on a more personal level, the more authentic it'll feel, the more authentic it'll be. And then the follow-up, which is the other part of the strategy, how do you use small talk to then follow up and build on that and really build a relationship? It feels really good. It's not as boring either. So you start looking forward to it. So let's take a look at the consequence if you don't. If you're so afraid of small talk or you quote unquote dislike it, here, non-native speakers often find themselves isolated from both social and professional conversations, impacting their ability to collaborate and participate fully. This is really important. As you can see here in the second part of this, this isolation can lead to reduced job satisfaction and diminished productivity due to the need for extra time to clarify instructions or resolve misunderstandings. This is so true. I worked with a client who she was in the C-suite position, and then when her company merged with a global company, they had to switch everything over to English. And the amount of anxiety it caused, the pain, just like the a job that was really fulfilling for her became a huge source of anxiety and something that was making her rethink her career and her, her work. So this is really important because the more that you are able to connect with people, the more fulfilling work will be. And then from a, a career standpoint, the more opportunities that you'll have. So this is all about connection. This is why it's such a big component of my program, because it's not just English. English is great, but until you learn how to connect and how to really communicate, that's when you start having not only more fun, but more results and more progress. So now what do you do? Of course, I can tell you, sure, just stop being afraid of small talk, but let's really strategize. So actionable tips for today. I want you to prepare three personal stories. Is something that I do in my program, and then I help my clients edit them and make sure that they sound really concise. And, and this sounds obvious. You're like, I can talk about personal things. I promise you, you have room for improvement. <laughs> so think about questions that you're normally asked. And if you haven't engaged in small talk conversations yet, think about maybe what people ask you in your native language or topics that tend to come up. If it's work, you've overheard your colleagues talk. If it's conferences, you kind of, you know, people are going to talk about, let's say the, the industry here, you want to do three personal stories. For example, how do you make an industry related conference and then take it personally? Maybe you want to prepare how you got into this job, how you got into this industry. Other great stories. If you're married or if you have a significant other, how did you meet? That was one of the stories that I worked with with one of my clients. I was like, great. Tell me how you met your wife. It was a disaster. <laughs> and it's be, and not a disaster. I'm laughing because it, it was so great when he realized what was happening. He's like, oh, this is so easy. But then when he was hearing himself and I gave him feedback and I'm like, you just told me the whole history of your life to tell me how you met your wife. And so he was able to laugh and think, oh, that's why people look at me that way. Because he realized that when he had said that in the past, people seemed a little disinterested or weren't reacting like he thought they should or would. And it's because the story took so long and it was had so many irrelevant details. So we were able to make it super concise, 
and then practice like what to ask next. So you can practice, how did you meet your significant other? You can practice, how'd you get into the industry? You can practice, what was it like moving to the US if you happen to have moved? What it's like living or growing up in your home country? You know, you want to think about what people are going to ask. If you have a strong accent, they'll probably say, oh, where are you from? You know, pick a personal story there. And that's going to help you feel confident bringing it up because we typically talk about the same things when we meet new people. So then you've got your base and you'll feel that you can bring something up confidently and then ask a question about the other person. Another thing you can do is ask simple questions. Now, the reason I bring this up and the reason I specify simple is because I find that once you do open up, then the nerves hit again. So now you've gone from hating small talk to being curious. And now you're like, okay, maybe I can do this. And then you're getting a little excited or nervous and you end up asking like five questions at once. And that's really overwhelming. The rhythm of American conversation is like tennis. It's short back and forth. So you're never going to go and give a full dialogue or monologue rather, and then expect someone to interrupt you. That's something else that's cultural. There are a lot of cultures where everyone kind of talks over each other and you just keep going until you're interrupted. American culture is different. It, they very much wait until you pause and ask a question. So you want to keep that rhythm going. Simple question. Keep it to one. <laughs> so if someone's talking about, um, let's say they say, oh, I'm from New York. And you follow up with, oh, really? I love New York. Do you like living there? When did you move there? Have you ever been to the Statue of Liberty? That's a lot. It can be overwhelming. And especially if you're if you're in a restaurant, it's really noisy. It's hard to hear. If you're in a conference, there are a lot of people trying to get everyone's attention. So it becomes really hard to answer it. And it makes the conversation dynamic kind of awkward. So this is a really, from a language perspective, it's really good because I'm telling you, say less. <laughs> Here's the other thing. I find that once I get people to simplify and just do one question, then what happens is you ask the question that you think you have to ask or that you think is correct to ask. Ask the question that leads to something that you're actually interested in. If you don't care about the weather where they're from, then don't ask about it. If you'd rather talk about hobbies, then ask about hobbies. Like, But acknowledge it. Like, say, oh, that's great that you're from New York. Um, by the way, what kind of hobbies are you into? And, and I would recommend sharing yours. Like, by the way, I, I just went swimming last weekend. I love to swim. What kind of things are you into? So that's how Americans communicate because the more you share a little bit of yourself, it establishes trust and it shows the expectation of how open you, you want to be and then how open their conversation or their response should be. So this gets a little more nuanced and that's the kind of things I go over in the program. We go deeper into the cultural strategy of small talk. But for now, your takeaway is keep it simple. Only ask one. Now, the other thing that's really great, and this you'll often find being taught when you're, um, if you ever study how to negotiate, it's a great negotiation tactic. But when I was studying that, I immediately thought this is fantastic for non-native speakers because you don't have to worry about full grammar. So a really easy way to keep the conversation going is you repeat a couple of words that the person said. And the trick here, not the trick, but the strategy, you have to do it with a question inflection, what we call an uptick. So for example, if someone says, what would be a good one? I went to Disney World last weekend. Oh, you went to Disney World? It's not that you're literally asking the question again, because that would be obvious. They just said that. But from a, a social cue, when you do that, it prompts the other person to keep talking about that topic. Yeah, you know, I took my kids there. They had such a blast. Um, it was so hot, though, blah, 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 blah. So just by picking a couple words that are of interest and then doing that question inflection, it's a wonderful way for you to start practice active listening. You're able to listen actively because you know you don't have to plan the grammar. Breathe. You're able to really relax your facial muscles and, and show your interest instead of your, your nervous planning. And that's going to help them feel like you're more interested in them. And then you asking these little things in a few words. Again, it builds that trust, it establishes you as someone who is interested, which people perceive that as you being interesting. Just a great way to build that 
executive presence, but also build your, your authentic personality. So let's take a look at this. This is why I do what I do. Small talk is wonderful when you're studying it on a general, you know, in a general way for English development. However, what I do in the program and what I did with you today, it's about how to do business. Because when you're coming from different cultural backgrounds, it changes. Different cultures have different cultural expectations. You might not know, or maybe in your culture, and this is fascinating, I, my background is in communication and intercultural relations. And so this is the stuff that I love the most. For a lot of cultures, the organization of, of conversation, specifically in business, is different. Some don't do small talk until the end. So you might come from a com from a culture where you think, if I have the small talk in the beginning, that's going to hurt my business relationship. However, in America, we value small talk first. Think about uh, a great example of this is when in corporate life, like when you take a client or when you do a dinner. With Americans, you would take your client out to dinner first, then do the deal, and then do the negotiations. Whereas in other cultures, you do the deal first, the negotiations, and then you do the dinner after. And so what that reflects is when is small talk valued? When you understand that from a business perspective, it really helps you have much better connections, close more deals, and feel like your expertise is able to shine through. So the third mistake that you're going to avoid is you're no longer going to avoid small talk and networking. Instead, you're going to make a plan to participate in more conversations. If I just tell you stop being afraid of small talk, let's be honest, it's not going to happen by tomorrow. Instead, the way I, I coach and the, what I want you to do is take action. Make a plan. For example, if you know that you go to the grocery store once a week, you can have a small goal of, okay, I'm going to start a conversation. I'm not going to go to the auto checkout where you just go by yourself. I'm going to get in line, old school, and I'm going to try to have a little small talk conversation with the person at the register. And that could be a weekly goal. You can try to plan the conversation of, okay, on Monday, I'm going to ask three people at work, or if you work virtually, I'm going to ask three people during my virtual meetings, how was their weekend? These are small moments of accountability that then lead to more moments where you feel brave and confident to have more small talk. So I want you to make a plan, maybe just for one week. What are you going to do and when are you going to do it? And then at the end of the week, you set up your next week and you can build on it. It's a great lifetime habit. So your takeaways for today are you're going to focus on your confidence. Your English is good enough. Yes, you can refine your pronunciation, but most importantly, work on your confidence, go back to the beginning of this webinar and focus on those three steps. You're going to get to the point. You're going to catch yourself when you're over explaining and say, you can even just use a first expression, right? You know, to make a long story short, this is what we're going to do. So it's not about being perfect from the beginning. In fact, perfection is never the goal. It's progress. Progress leads to much more growth and perfection anyway. So you're going to catch yourself and redirect. That's your first goal. You cannot fix a problem you're not aware of. So my first goal with anything is become aware. Aware of how often you're breathing. Become aware of how often you're not breathing. Become aware of when you're not talking, of when you're over explaining. This is huge. These are things you didn't know were actually the problem and what you need to be aware of in order to implement the solution. And last but not least for today is you're going to make a plan to participate, a plan to have small talk. Now, all of this leads into, now I'll introduce the Leadership Communication Accelerator. This is a three-month program that I have, and this is going to break down all of the things that we talked about today, but we go much more in depth to speak with confidence, communicate with clarity, and connect with authenticity. These are the three pillars that I find will set the foundation, again, exponential growth. I never want linear growth. You're not at a position where you have a lot of time to wait. You got to get those results quick and do it in a way where everything builds on itself. So here are the results of the program, which hopefully you'll feel after implementing the things that we went over today, is you're going to be more confident. And when you're more confident, you're able to be more assertive. That's different than aggressive. So this is really helpful when you have to set boundaries, when you have to be clear at work as a leader. 
you can't just be friendly all the time. Being assertive in a diplomatic way is very strategic and very helpful. You also get to think faster. <laughs> the most frustrating thing, the reason that you freeze, sometimes it's because you're thinking so fast that you can't structure your response fast enough and that causes that freeze or your mind goes completely blank. So through the program training, you're going to be able to process your own thoughts differently and then understand how to express them in a simple way that reflects how Americans communicate. Another result of the training is connection. Connection is everything, not only on a personal fulfilling level, but connection is everything for business. I was just talking to a client today, introverts, and what I find is non-native speakers become introverts, even if they aren't in their native language, because of the language insecurity. Introverts do great in business, and I think they make fantastic leaders. Unfortunately, what Americans value, what tends to happen is extroverts get the promotions. Extroverts get the opportunities. I want you to be yourself, so we're going to find your most confident self, and then the strategy for you to get the attention and make the connections that you need to further your career. And you're also going to be able to lead your team or lead your company more effectively. You're in a leadership position, or maybe you're in a professional position where you're ready for those leadership opportunities. So this is going to help you be a more effective leader. And a big part of being a leader in a multinational company, for example, you're adapting to several different things. Because the people that I work with, not only are you adapting to the American communication, when you have teams that are global, it also helps you have this sensitivity of how you need to communicate in a way that connects with them better and gets the best out of your team. Because really, that's what you want. You want to create a, an environment that's safe, productive, and clear so that they can bring their best selves to the table and produce what you need them to. And you're going to say yes to more opportunities. I want you to tell me at the beginning of the program, what are your goals? I had one client who his goal was to be on more podcasts to be able to talk about the company and be able to talk about um, things in the industry. So I tailored the program to him. The tasks that we have that are more independent, I focused on, okay, I'm going to do the research. Here are 10 questions that are usually asked in tech podcasts. Write down the answers or record yourself answering them and let's get them sharper so that when you do have that opportunity, you're ready. Maybe for you, it's going to a conference and giving a speech. Great. You're going to work on that and that's going to be what I'm going to give you feedback. So you want to make sure that not only are you okay to say yes to opportunities, but I say prepare for them. If you already know what some opportunities are, let's get you ready for them. So let's take a look here at some more amazing results. So this client of mine came to me. Again, the, his manager told him, you need to work on your accent. This was such a blow to his confidence, but it put him on the right path to find me. He thought, okay, I just need to work on my English and I need to work on my pronunciation. But as we did the program, he realized that Oh, okay. My manager was telling me this because his insecurity with the language was making him not really speak up and it was hard to hear. But as a native speaker, his manager assumed it must be his English. That's the problem. So we worked on projecting the voice. We worked on active listening, being able to answer concisely because his answers were too, too long, too rambling. And so it made it seem Oddly enough, the more English you speak, sometimes it makes you sound like you don't know enough English. And that feels like it's a contradiction, but it's about the communication style. So once we were able to do that, then he felt really confident to realize, oh, okay, now I can say yes to more opportunities. And that morphed into finding a better, a better way for him to grow his career and be able to start at a new company with just the most amazing confidence and actually volunteer <laughs> to run an internal podcast. So that went from not wanting to speak up to being the voice of his department. So this is something that I know that you can also achieve, but it's about having the right strategy and the right process. So what have you tried? Maybe you've tried courses, books, and programs that have helped. You know, everything helps in a certain way, but it hasn't pushed you enough. And what I find with books, for example, that's a lot more passive learning. So you're gaining a lot of knowledge. That's wonderful, but you don't have the space to safely practice and get feedback. With courses and programs, maybe you are, you've tried more English teachers or, or English programs, and those are great, but it didn't push you enough in terms of being able to speak up in meetings. 
because I've had people tell me, you know, I took this English course, but I still got nervous when it came to presentations. It's like, well, those are two separate skills. It's helpful, but presenting is a very different skill. Not only is it public speaking, but you also have the, the strategy of how to present information, how to make it concise, how to have retention, it's a whole science to it. And it's amazing, but you're not going to get that from an English only course. So then you want to think about, okay, I've spent all that money on this. This is going to be another investment. So I like to really put it into perspective of what is it costing you if you don't? So it's okay. I understand that this is an investment, maybe for now, maybe for later, but I still want you to really observe, okay, wh what is this doing to my quality of life that could be fixable with this investment? Your mental health. When I tell you the level of anxiety that the leaders that I coach feel, the way that they know that if they have a meeting with a big, with the executive board, or if they have to present at a meeting the next day, they are super anxious 48 hours before, that spikes your cortisol, your adrenaline, your sleep is affected. When your sleep is affected, it becomes a lot harder to think of the right word. So when it comes to like the cognitive process, when you're not rested, you're going to go more into fight or flight mode when you're in that adrenaline moment and you're not going to be able to have the recall to communicate and express yourself smoothly. So these are all things that are really important to consider that when you're just studying English, you don't you know, because you're trying to learn verbs and grammar and, and phrasal verbs, and that's wonderful. But what you need at the leadership level is much more nuanced. Effective leadership. This is where, this is where the cost really shines through. When you're not an effective leader, you could be costing your company millions of dollars. Because of, usually I work with companies who are multinational and you have a lot on the line contracts that are on the line. The presentations that I coach are usually 10 to $50 million contracts. If you don't have that small talk that's really effective at the beginning, if you don't establish that trust with the client, if you don't present in a way that hooks them, that really allows them to feel that you are the person to trust for that service, you know, investing in a tiny course is nothing compared to what you could potentially lose. So you want to think about what are the moments where your insecurity or your lack of English communication is hurting your leadership. And then you can probably put a dollar sign to how much it's costing you in terms of the profession. <sighs> and it's, it's astounding. And then career growth. Every time you say no to an opportunity that hurts your career growth. And like I said before, once you've climbed the corporate ladder, by the time you're getting to the top, people that talk more and, and do it effectively, the people that get more attention are the people that get more opportunities. Whether that's right or wrong, I understand we like to think we're in a meritocracy, but the reality is that. And so this is something that you can have. So we can figure out how to get you into the conference circuit. We can figure out how to be more engaging in bigger presentations, go represent your company at the headquarters, not just in your city. So this is where you make those connections, go to more conferences just to attend, but you want to talk to more people, how to connect with them on LinkedIn, something that is a shift. A lot of countries don't use LinkedIn as much as Americans do. So being able to understand how to use that to grow your virtual and global network is a wonderful strategy as well. So what we do in the program is we have a multifaceted approach. It includes, if you do the executive program, I have group and executive, you would get the one-on-one -on -one coaching. The group program is fantastic where you not only get to meet peers, but it's a collective learning process that's very efficient. You also have a bespoke learning where we talk about your goals and make sure that all of the activities that we do support your goals and your needs. So it's not just a generic theoretical program. It's more about actionable takeaways. So this is something that will help you really feel that those three months, you're getting support all over. Parts of the program are flexible, so they can be done whenever is works for you because real life is busy, and that's going to help you get even more out of it. So let's talk about who this is not for. This program is not for everyone, <laughs> I will admit it. Number one, I don't take everyone. You have to apply first, and then if you're selected, you make it through the program. So I want to make sure that you self-eliminate if this is not for you. If you just want to learn and you don't want to implement, and this is something you have to be very self-aware about. A lot of people just love learning. You just want to get the certificate. You want to prove that you did X program. That's fine, but this is not the best investment for that. 
This is really about learning and implementing. It's all about you talking more, you getting more direct feedback, and then doing it again and again. If you don't want personal, actionable feedback, this is very important. A lot of people just like to, again, learn, you want to do, you want to get it done. The difference with this program is it's very personal. I'm going to have you send me your presentations. You send me a recording of you in meetings so I can really see what you're doing and then help you do it better. If that might be too fragile for the ego or you don't want that kind of very specific feedback, that's okay. You know yourself better than anybody else. This is not the program for you. It, what I do is very much break it down so you can build it back up. And this is not for you if you're too busy. This is really a time commitment. As you saw before, a lot of it is designed to be flexible. So maybe you want to work on it 20 minutes a day. Maybe you just want to do it on the weekends, depending on how your schedule is. But be realistic. If you have other priorities or if you know that you're burnt out at work and no matter how great the program is, you just would rather watch a movie or scroll on TikTok, that's fine. I'm not criticizing, but be aware that maybe this is not the moment for you. So this is for you if you're ready. If you're ready. A big part of the program is I want you to like actually be confident, but this is also about looking and sounding confident even if you don't feel it. I'm very much a pragmatist. I understand that sometimes whether it's English insecurity or your kids were up all night and you're exhausted or you have so much pressure because the economy dipped or the production line, something happened. In those moments of high stress, you're going to have the mechanisms, the, the tools, the practice to be able to look and sound confident until the inside catches up. And I find that that is really important because perfectionism is not effective. So if you just wait until everything is perfect for you to be able to perform perfectly, it's just not going to happen and you're going to be constantly disappointed and you're not going to get better results. So if you're ready to look, feel, and sound more confident in English, this is a good program for you if you're ready to work smarter and not harder. What I mean by that, I find that most people that are attracted to this program are used to doing a lot all the time. For the three months that I have you for this intensive program, I don't want you to use any other resource. It's about working smarter, not harder. I had a client ask me, okay, I'm gonna do all the program things. Should I also watch your other YouTube videos or do this or do that? I said, no, I love my YouTube channel, <laughs> but this is not the time. For these three months, just do the program videos, the training, the coaching, and then I'll give you specific resources to do. Because when you do it smarter, you're going to get better results that you're able to then grow after the program. So if you're willing to just trust the process and not overdo it, this is a program and the moment for you. And if you want results faster. So again, this is a three month program. I could have spread it out over the year, but three months is where I find you get significant results. You create the habits. A big part of this program is creating habits in terms of growth and improvement that you can do after. And then if you want to continue with one-on-one -on -one coaching, we can, but in those three months, you're going to learn what you need to take your leadership communication to the next level. So if all of that sounds like what you're ready for, go ahead and apply at tanyasuarez.com slash leadership. The next program opens on November 19th. If you can get in and get the application call soon, you qualify for a bonus one-on-one -on -one coaching session before the 19th. So make sure you get the application call in and I hope to see you in the program.